feeding of the 5,000. Now, there's several reasons why people believe that's the greatest miracle Jesus ever wrought. In the first place, it's the only miracle. This is significant. It's the only miracle that's recorded by all four of the gospel writers. All four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. It is the miracle, and I'm talking about earthly miracles, it is the miracle that involved the largest number of people. There were 5,000 men beside women and children. There might have been 15, 18, there might have been 20,000 people that were fed uh, in, in this great miracle. It's a miracle that involved the largest number of people of any miracle Jesus wrought while he was on the earth. It's believed to be the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed. Now, at the close of that miracle, Jesus did a very wonderful thing. I must confess to you, I've never really understood exactly why Jesus did just what he did. He sent to the twelve disciples, after this miracle had been performed, from taking the lunch of a little lad, and by his miraculous touch, had fed all these thousands of people of five little biscuits, two little dried fish. He fed this great multitude. Then he said to the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. And they gathered up twelve baskets full. Now why twelve? I do not know. I think maybe the Lord is teaching these twelve disciples something. He's teaching them that little is much if God is in it. And each disciple had a basket full when they started with a handful. And it's the greatest miracle Jesus ever wrought. Now I'm saying that in order to say this. These disciples, the twelve, had seen this great miracle, had participated in it, the Lord had had the folks to sit down in companies by hundreds and by fifties, and the disciples had broken the bread and, and it had been multiplied, and the thousand had been fed. They had had an actual participation in this great miracle. Now then, after this great miracle, there happens what I'm going to read to you about tonight. After the great miracle and how their hearts must have been thrilled, they're going to go through the greatest experience, the most traumatic experience I think probably the disciples ever went through. After the great miracle, there comes a great traumatic experience. And if I had the time tonight, I could go with you, of course, from one place in the Bible to another, and show you that after the greatest blessing, there always comes the greatest attack. You'll remember that even about the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Bible said that He, being filled with the Holy Ghost, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. It is after the beautiful baptism of Jesus the Holy Spirit coming upon him in the form of a heavenly dove. And the audible voice of God the Father speaking, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It is after this great blessing that the Lord fasts for forty days and forty nights, and is assaulted by Satan with three great assaults that would have overcome any human being that ever lived on the face of the earth. But not Jesus, because he proved to be the perfect one. But I'm saying to you, it's a truth, it's a principle, it's an axiom in the Bible, that after great blessing and great victory, there always comes great attack from Satan. It'd be well for us to remember that, but human like we are, in the midst of our blessings, we think it's going to always be that way. It's like the three disciples Jesus took on the mountaintop 
when he was transfigured. And they saw this great heavenly scene. And they had the privilege to see Moses and Elijah. One who'd been dead 1,500 years. The other approximately 900 years had been in heaven. At least one never died. Saw them come and meet on the mountain top. And they were so thrilled that Peter said, Lord, let us build here three tabernacles. He was so excited that he said, let's just stay here forever. But he didn't stop to realize down at the foot of the mountain was a broken-hearted father with a demon-possessed son that needed the master's touch. After every victory, great blessing, there always comes the mightiest attack of the devil. How well it would be if Christians would remember that. If we would fortify ourselves with the word of God in prayer and uh, the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit. And so I wanted to mention to you tonight that the scripture I'm reading to you is one of the most traumatic experiences that disciples or anyone else could ever go through. It's almost hair-raising if you were not a Christian to read about this experience we're going to read about tonight. If one were not a Christian did not know the Lord, see the wonderful way that it turned out. It would almost be a hair-raising experience to read about it. But let's read in Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 22, and we shall read to the end of the chapter. And will you give careful attention to the reading of God's blessed and wonderful word? And straightway, see, this is after the greatest miracle Jesus ever wrought. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. And I got to thinking of that expression today, he was there alone. And it'd be a wonderful text. I'm not going to preach on it tonight, but I, I'd like for you to think about it a little bit. You find Jesus alone much of the time. You fi find him alone in prayer much of the time as you read the Gospels. But you take a large section, for instance, of the Gospel of John. In the 13th, 14th, and 15th, and 16th chapters of John, Jesus is alone with his own. He is alone with just Christian people. And he gives what is called there the Paschal Discourse. He goes from the upper room to the bloody garden, and he's alone with his own. In the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, he is alone with his Father. For the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John is the high priestly prayer of our Lord. When he prayed not only for the twelve, the disciples, but he prayed prophetically even for you and for me. And he's alone with his father in the 17th chapter of John. In the 18th chapter of John, Jesus was alone with his enemies. For it is in that chapter they taunt him and persecute him and ridicule him. And Jesus is alone with his enemies. In the 19th chapter of John... He is alone with my sins and yours upon him on the cross. No one could be with him when he died for my sin. For the Bible said the Father cannot look upon sin and cannot behold iniquity. And the Father turned his face away and the Son cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus was alone with my sin. In the 20th chapter of John, he was alone in the tomb. All alone. All alone. So when you read here that Jesus was alone, you're reading a tremendous statement. He was there. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. 
But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come to thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. And when they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Genesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out unto all the country round about, brought unto him all that were diseased, and besought him that they might, on, might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. And I want to take from this uh, passage of Scripture tonight a very, very brief little statement. And yet one in which there is wrapped up so much truth that I will apply to your heart and mind that it's impossible to describe. I want to take the words of Peter as he's sinking beneath the boisterous waves. This brave and co courageous man who is the only man I know of who walked upon the water other than Jesus. And all of a sudden, this courageous man who walked upon the water begins to sink and he cries out, Lord, save me. And I want to take that for a text for a few moments tonight. And I want you to remember it, these are the words of a Christian. If I were to take this text tonight and say to you, these are the words of an unsaved person. You, of course, would know my sermon before I ever preached it. But these are not the words of an unsaved man crying out for his sins to be forgiven. But these are the words of a Christian crying, Lord, save me, deliver me. There is a threefold picture here tonight before we just kind of zero in on this little statement. That there's a threefold picture here in this, in this passage that you see of the Lord and his, and the relationship of the disciples to him. I think for, for, in the first place, there's a picture here of the disciples without Jesus. Now, of course, I know your heart says and so do mine, never is a Christian without Jesus. But there is, as far as all visible outward evidence is concerned, here is a picture of the disciples without Jesus. You remember he put them in a boat. He said to them, go over to the other side. And they rode all night long against a wind head on against their ship. And Jesus was on the mountain top praying for them. But they were in that storm, and they felt all alone. And so I think you see here what might be called a picture of the disciples without Jesus. Though we, we know that the Bible teaches that's an impossibility for a Christian. There's never a step you could ever take, an experience you could ever have, an emotion you could ever feel, a fear you could ever know 
There is nothing that could ever happen to you when you could truthfully say, I was without the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we have his blessed word, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. But there is a picture here, it seems, for a moment at least, the disciples were in the midst of the storm and they were without the Lord. I see another relationship here of the disciples to Jesus. They saw then a Jesus whom they did not really know and did not recognize. Jesus came to them wrapped in the form of a miracle. He is a miracle. But he came walking upon the stormy waves. And it would seem to me tonight and to you, 2,000 years this side of the experience, knowing what you know and I know about the Bible, it would seem that if they had seen one walking upon the water, they would have had to have said, This is Jesus! For no one else walks upon the water but the Son of God. But such was not the case. The Bible said they thought they'd seen the Spirit. And they did not recognize. Here they have a Christ they don't know. And they don't recognize. And oh, my dear friends, I think that this is applicable to the lives of all of us tonight. Sometimes when sickness and sorrow and death and disappointment comes, it's Jesus walking upon our troubled waters. But we do not always recognize him as such. So yeah, first of all, the disciples without Jesus, rowing, struggling, on these boisterous waves, they had been perhaps nine hours because the night is divided into four watches. And the Lord does not come and step on that boat till the fourth watch of the night. And I want to say to you, He may not step on your boat on the stormy sea as soon as you expect that He will. But one day He'll step aboard and He'll calm your waves. He always has. He always does. But there's a third wonderful picture of Jesus here that I want you to see. First of all, there were the disciples seemingly without him. He was yonder on a high mountain apart praying. And they were in the stormy sea below, troubled and rowing. Then they saw Jesus they did not know. But then they saw a Jesus whom they did know. Because the Bible says, Straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And then they recognized, This is Jesus. And their fears were relieved. But you know, there's something about Simon Peter that I, I'm just not able to explain. I tell you, this this man thrills me. He's bombastic. He's vigorous. He's daring. He's a man's man. This man, Simon Peter. None of the others said this, but Peter did. Peter said, Lord, if it be thee, bid me come to thee on the water. And I've read where Bible students of the and the ancient languages of the Bible have said that the word, if it be thee, could be translated like in other instances. It's not if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so will God bring with him those who sleep in him. It's since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, will God bring with him. And what Peter is actually saying, Since it be thee, bid me come to thee upon the waters. And Jesus said to Peter, Well, come to me. And Peter began to walk upon the waters, and he walked toward Jesus. You know the well, well-worn truth, the story, it's been often, often, often 
quoted and preached upon. Simon Peter's for a moment took his eyes off of the Lord and he put them on the circumstances. That's always the wrong thing to do. No matter what the circumstances are, we must look full in the face of Jesus Christ. For there and there alone does the Christian heart find tranquility and peace. But for a moment he looked from the face of Jesus to the boisterous waves. And when he did, he began to sink. And as he began to sink, he cried, Lord, save me. And the Lord took him by the hand, lifted him up, and they walked together on the water and went back to the boat. And when they got on the boat, all the disciples fell upon their faces on the deck of the little vessel and worshipped the Lord Jesus. But Peter said, save me. Now everyone in this building tonight, this preacher included, if we're saved, somewhere, sometime, somewhere, sometime, we have said to the Lord, Lord, save me. There's no other way to get to heaven. Man must be saved. When the angel announced the coming of the Lord Jesus through the womb of the virgin, he said, She shall bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And when a man said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The thrilling answer was, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And when the Lord saved the crooked little Zacchaeus in the awful city of Jericho, the Bible says the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And the Word of God says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So every Christian has asked that, has made that prayer. Sometime, somewhere, if you're saved tonight, you've said, Lord, save me. Fortunate are those people who know the very place. And even more fortunate are those who can remember the very time. Because when Paul gave his testimony, he said it was noonday on the Damascus Road. He remembered where it was and what time it was. And he had a good explanation of what happened. So everyone has said, Lord, save me from sin. If you haven't, you're not saved. If you haven't, you're still lost. If you've never said, Lord, save me from sin, be my Savior, come into my life, make me a new creature in Christ. If you've never prayed that prayer, then there's no way a person can be saved. So every one of us tonight who know the Lord have said, Lord, save me from sin. But I won't take, I said, this, these are the words of a Christian. Simon Peter is born again. Simon Peter, if he'd have gone on down to the bottom of the Sea of Galilee and swallowed half of the sea and gone uh, into death that night, he would have gone to heaven. Because he was saved. But he said, Lord, save me. And what I'm thinking tonight is that sometimes Christians need to say, Lord, save me from certain things. Peter was saying, save me from this awful circumstance. This fearful night. And I think it imprinted itself on their minds till they never forgot it. Peter said, save me from drowning. I think sometimes Christians need to pray to the Lord, Lord, save me from certain things. And I think I meet Christians along the way who have not been saved. They're saved and they're going to heaven. But they need to be saved yet from certain things. I think a Christian ought to say, Lord, save me from bitterness. You know, I meet Christians everywhere I go that are bitter about something. Like the preacher's wife I told you about this morning, trouble in the church caused her husband to die 
and one son to grieve himself to death and one daughter to go in the world. You know, the Bible says that being saved from bitterness is so important that the Lord Jesus said, if you're going to the altar to offer thy gift and you remember that you, that thy brother hath ought against thee, first be reconciled to thy brother. I do not know of anything. I do not know of anything that will ruin the life of a Christian more than bitterness. You say, but I have cause to be bitter. No. No one has cause to be bitter. And the first thing you should do after any experience in unpleasant in your life is pray, Lord, save me from bitterness. You see, the Bible says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed on the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake forgave you. Ephesians 4, 30 and 32. Lord, save me from bitterness. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently lest any should fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and trouble you. Hebrews 12, 14 and 15. See, if you have bitterness, bitterness, it may not hurt the one against whom you have the bitterness. But God said, lest it spring up and trouble you. Lord, save me from bitterness. Oh, how many people I've had say to me in my ministry, I'm having a hard time getting over my wounds. And there are a lot of wounded people. But there should not be no bitter people. I think sometimes Christians need to say, Lord, save me from hypocrisy. Now, I want you to understand something. Every weak Christian is not a hypocrite. I think a Christian that knows himself or herself, knows himself, knows himself, and knows how to go to God about himself, is not a hypocrite. Judas Iscariot was a hypocrite. Judas Iscariot pretended to love the lost and to love the Lord and to love the other disciples and made people believe that he was a missionary-minded preacher. Judas Iscariot was a hypocrite. He wore more than one face. Hypocrites call attention to themselves because Jesus said, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. He said, do not pray to be seen of men. And he said, fast not as the hypocrites do. And he said, thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye. Hypocrites. Say, you know, it's something in your eye. But really, they can't get close enough to you to help you because of beam in theirs. And they can't get the mold out of yours with a beam between them and you. He said, Jesus did, thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye. Hypocrites criticize other people far less than they're guilty of themselves. Jesus said, Be not as the hypocrites, and draw nigh with thy lips, but not with your heart. And fifteen times, I think, in the Gospels, Jesus said, Be not as the hypocrites are. Lord, save me from hypocrisy. Being a weak Christian, knowing your sin and confessing it to God daily is one thing. But being a studious hypocrite is another thing. 
It brings criticism against other people for sins less than those of yourself. Lord, save me from hypocrisy. Lord, I think sometimes Christians need to pray, Lord, save me from complacency. Because I think it's a great complacency. It's one of the most harmful things you find in churches today. I think it's the most harmful thing in this church. You know, you talk about church in one accord. And I, I think it's wonderful when you have a church that's like a family and people love one another. But you know, it's not just, it's not just enough to be in one accord. You can get so, so loving one with another that you can get complacent. And you, you forget about the person who needs a Savior who's on the outside. Paul said, I say the truth in Christ and lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish myself a curse from Christ. For my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Lord, save me from complacency. I read every day of my life. You do too if you read newspapers. If you read anything, every day of your life you'll read a complacency. A whole group of people in New York City some years ago watched a woman attack viciously, sexus, sexually, Brutally, in broad open daylight, witnessed by many people, slashed with a knife over and over, and the words of every one of them to the reporter was, I did not want to get involved. And I want to tell you tonight, if you sit here and you're saved, and I guess nearly everyone is saved here tonight, you're saved because someone was willing to get involved. I know there's no question about it. I'm saved tonight because dear old country Methodist preacher was willing to get involved. Lord, save me from complacency. And lastly, Lord, save me from spiritual barrenness. Oh, I believe this is a prayer Christians ought to pray. Lord, save me. Peter said, if these things be in you and abound, they make that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. Do you know that in the Bible, what the worst thing in this world that could happen to a woman, you know what the worst thing that could happen to a believing woman, a godly woman in the Bible, was not to get sick with cancer, not to get leprosy, but the worst thing that could happen to a believing woman in the Bible was to be a barren woman. And the Bible is filled with instances where women were barren and they prayed with such fervency until God worked miracles like that of Hannah and little Samuel came, like that of the mother of Samson and the strongest man that ever lived was born, like that of Elizabeth who prayed because she was barren and she felt old. Oh, if God would just bless me, that I would not be barren. And John the Baptist was born. You see, barrenness, barrenness, spiritual barrenness is an awful calamity. God save me from spiritual barrenness. Lord, help me to be fruitful. For Jesus said, if you bear much fruit herein, is my Father glorified? God frowns upon spiritual barrenness. And you know, it would be an awful thing for a Christian to meet the Lord and be barren. And all of us are going to meet Him. And wouldn't it be an awful thing to meet the Lord and having been in Emmanuel Baptist Church where many hundreds and thousands of people have been saved where soul winning has been preached on and, now, uh, and taught and, and where people are saved uh, nearly every, every service, uh, every Sunday, as they have been already today. 
Wouldn't it be an awful thing for a Christian to come out of this church, someday meet the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, and stand with empty hands and say, Lord, I have not one single trophy to lay at your feet. You know, I believe tonight, and I'm, I'm not trying to be pious. I don't think I'm any, any better Christian than you are, maybe not as good. But I believe tonight, if I'd never won a soul to Christ, it'd be hard for me to lay my head on the pillow and go to sleep, fearing I might meet the Lord and say, Lord, these hands are empty. You see, Christians need to pray, Lord, save me from barrenness. Shall we pray?